trespassers, a tribute to Benny Rothman and all fighters for the freedom to roam, by Mal Carroll, narrated by the author. No Man Has a Right to Own Mountains, Chapter 8 Is that it? I thought it would be massive. Well, it may not be very big, but it's very old, and once upon a time it would have been mounted on a large stone base, no doubt. But it's got a date, Ralph, 1810. Grandad told me it was medieval. Your grandfather's quite right, Rosie. The date was carved on it by three farmers. They found it buried in the peat. It's definitely much older. They carved the date on it when they erected it here in 1810, along with their initials. Oh, Alice laughed. You don't have to sound so sceptical, Rosie. Ralph's not going to misinform you any more than Grandad would. I just expected something grander. She rested her arms on top of the wall and gazed across the Edel Valley. The old pack horse track stretched ahead to her left, following the contour of the hill as it rounded the great bulk of Kindalo. She pointed, turning to Ralph as she did so. What's that great lump there? That's Mam Tor. See how it's shaped at the top. It were owned to quite a large number of people a long time ago, Rosie. It were an Iron Age fort. You can still make out the defensive ditches around the summit. Why did people live so high up? Because it was safer. The valleys were dangerous places made up of dense forest, marshy ground, and populated by wild animals. People lived up on Kinder during the Neolithic Age. Neo what? Neolithic, Rosie. Basically, the Stone Age. How do you know? Because archaeologists have discovered stone axes and other tools buried under the peat. Neolithic man inhabited the area, and all this high ground was heavily wooded. They cut and burned the trees down to make clearings for their settlements and for pasture. Then, over thousands of years, the weather caused erosion and the wood turned into peat. People think this is all wild, natural country, but human beings have helped to shape it along with nature. How do you know? Rosie repeated. I was taught it in school and there's information about it in the Edel National Park Information Centre. Come on, Rosie, Alice interrupted. If we shape ourselves, we'll have time to visit the Information Centre. Then you can see for yourself. They recommenced their journey, and for once Rosie remained quiet, seemingly content to gaze around her, to take in the magnificent views stretching out before her and to her right. However, this unusual turn of events didn't last long. Ralph, what did Connie mean about getting a new leg? She had an accident, Rosie, about four years ago. She were hit by a motorbike and it damaged her leg. They had to amputate just below the knee. That's terrible, Alice responded. Why she had to wait so long for an artificial leg? She hasn't, it's just that she's growing fast. She was only six when the accident happened, she's ten now. The leg's been lengthened a number of times. Normally she would have had a replacement already, but there's been some new developments. A new kind of fitting was invented earlier this year, in America I think and Connie will be one of the first to try it in this country. There's been a slight hold-up. Trouble is, her old leg's worn, the socket's damaged, and it hurts when she wears it, so she's hanging on for the new one. Will she be able to walk, then? Rosie asked. Yes, she can walk fine now. She's hoping to be able to run. The only trouble is, she tends to overdo it and overtires herself. It takes a lot more energy using an artificial limb. She wants to keep up with all her school friends. She's stubborn, just like Feather. She's such a little thing. Yes, she is, Rosie, but don't let that kid you. My little sister's as tough as old boots and always up to mischief. Whatever you do, don't let her think you feel sorry for her. Oh dear, Alice said. Maybe we'd best keep the two of them separated. Connie and Rosie might form a lethal combination. Ma'am, Alice laughed. I'm only joking. 
She smiled and winked at Ralph. At least I think I'm only joking. Where's Titch? Ralph stopped in his tracks. I've no idea, Rosie. Maybe he got fed up and went home. But he was here a moment ago. I wouldn't worry, Rosie. He's unlikely to get lost. At that moment, something caught his eye. Now, Rosie, he said, gripping her shoulder momentarily, there's something I bet you haven't seen before. She followed his pointing finger. Where? I can't see anything. There, just under that boulder, halfway up the slope. Oh, look, ma'am, it's a white rabbit. No, Ralph interjected. It's a mountain air, Rosie. They turn completely white in winter. In summer, they are light brown or grey with a white belly. The dark peak is the only place in England you find them. There's plenty in Scotland and a few in the Isle of Man. Alice strained her eyes, but it was some time before she located the animal, and then it was on the move. I think I'm going to have to buy some binoculars, she said. I want to see the ring oozles in the spring. Ring oozles? What are they? Mountain blackbirds, Alice and Ralph informed her in the same breath. They rounded a bend in the trap. Look, there's Titch, Rosie exclaimed. With that man. The rather diminutive figure, sitting on a rock in the shelter of the dry stone wall, was eating a sandwich, bits of which he was breaking off for the dog. He looked up as they approached, a broad smile on his face. Rosie thought he looked for all the world like a wizened old elf. Alice suddenly asked, Is that you, Benny? And without waiting for an answer followed up with, It's so good to see you. What are you doing up here? Apparently he was who she thought he was, for he scrambled to his feet, his hand extended. Alice O'Donnell, isn't it? This is a pleasant surprise. How was your dad? Sat at home nursing a twisted ankle. She laughed. Is it that long since we met? I married ages ago, Benny. My name's Ackroyd. This is my daughter Rosie and our friend Ralph. He nodded and shook Ralph's hand before turning his attention to Rosie. Goodness, Alice. She's a spitting image of your mother. Rosie smiled, but something niggled at the back of her mind. There was something strangely familiar about this peculiar-looking man with his impish smile and elven features, yet she knew she had never met him before. Are you on your way to Edale, Alice? Yes, we're heading for the Nag's Head for lunch. We're staying with Ralph on his dad's farm. Ralph rescued Dad last weekend. Do you mind if I join you? Of course not, Benny. What an idea. It's our pleasure. I just wish Dad was here. He'll be kicking himself when I tell him. Is he keeping well apart from his uncle? He's fighting fit. He brought Rosie up here last Saturday to show her the scene of the battle. He twisted his ankle running down William Clough of all places. Benny chuckled. Silly old so-and-so. Rosie smiled, awareness dawning. Are you Benny Rothman? she asked somewhat shyly. Yes, I plead guilty to that, Rosie, although I've been called far worse. Grandad says you're a living legend, he says. Your grandad always had a tendency to be carried away with his own words, Rosie. As you can see, I'm a perfectly ornery bloke. Ralph smiled to himself. He might be only fifteen, but he'd seen the photographs and the displays in the National Park Information Centre and he'd heard his father's debates with some of his farming colleagues. There were those who loved him, and those who spoke about him with scorn, but there were few who didn't respect Benny Rothman. All four began the descent of Jacob's ladder, Rosie carefully rehearsing the questions she wanted to put to the old man as soon as they reached the nag's head. Grandad had never finished his story of the mass trespass. She needed to know what happened after they descended from Ashant Moor, why Grandad said those events had changed Britain's history for the better, and the role his friend Benny Rothman had played in them. Thus Rosie returned to the farm, a wiser young lady, than when she started out that morning, and both Alice and Ralph returned with more information than they'd the two known. Little did she know that she still had a lot more to learn, and that a surprise awaited her. 
She was the first across the yard apart from Titch. She opened the door to the kitchen and stopped in her tracks. A smiling face grinned at her from across the table, through the vapour arising from a mug of tea he was about to take a sip from. What looked like a brand new crutch lamped against the back of his chair? Grandad, how did you get here? Guess who I've met. No Man Has a Right to Own Mountains Chapter 9 So, what did you learn from Benny? Well, that he and five others landed in jail for a start, and that you were lucky not to. The old man nodded his head, but didn't speak. He explained how a group of coppers were waiting at the bottom of William Clough, near the reservoir, and how, when they tried to make arrests, the trespassers chased them away. Grandad laughed, but Rosie hadn't finished, and he told me how the chief constable met you on Kinder Road and suggested you followed his car down towards the railway station, and the police were waiting there and arrested Benny and his friends. The old man nodded again, and he said the police wanted to let them go, but the Duke of Thingimmy Bob insisted on charging them, and Benny said that was the biggest mistake he could have made, because it made them notorious, and everybody were up in arms and thought they were being badly treated, and all kinds of people were upset by it, and so it became a massive public campaigning issue. Grandad chuckled. <laughs> Don't rush all at once, Rosie, my love. Try taking a breath now and again. But you're quite right. The Duke of Devonshire shot himself in the foot, and that's how the course of English history was changed. The public outcry was taken up by politicians, and eventually, after the war, the new Labour government brought in the first access to the Countryside Act, and initiated the first national park, which is where we are now, in the Peak District National Park. Yes, Grandad, but Benny said it wasn't the first mass trespass, and it wasn't the last, and there's going to be even more. He said it was only one battle in a war that hasn't been won. There's still hundreds of thousands of acres of uncultivated land where it's still illegal to walk, and we still have to fight for the right to have the freedom to roam in our own country. And he's promised to let me know when the next one will take place. I've given him our phone number, and he'll be in touch. And so you see, Grandad, I'm going to be a trespasser too. Mrs. Gartside laughed. Good for you, Rosie. That's the spirit. I think I'll be a trespasser as well. Up to that point, Connie hadn't spoken. She sat in front of the fire, a carroty red hair gleaming dark gold in the light from the glowing coals, stroking Titch who lay in the crook of her one good leg, although she'd been listening attentively to everything that had been said. Connie, Mrs. Gartside responded, don't set yourself tasks. I'm not helpless, Mum. As soon as I've got my new leg, I'd like to show Rosie the mermaid's pool. You'll never get up there. She already has, Ralph interrupted his voice soft. I went with her. It was last July. Connie's much more agile than you think. But why did you never tell me? Mrs. Gartside appeared staggered by this information. Connie shook her head, sending her wavy hair sweeping in a great curve before looking into her mother's eyes. I swore Ralph to secrecy. I didn't want to worry you. Anyway, if I told you we were going, you would have stopped me. What's the mermaid's pool? Rosie wanted to know. I thought you only got mermaids in the sea. There's lots of tales about it, Ralph began, before his sister interjected. A beautiful water nymph with a fish's tail lives there, Rosie, and on the eve of Easter at midnight, she comes to the surface, and if any man sees her, she has the power to make him immortal, providing he's truly not afraid of her, and treats her with courtesy. But if she takes a dislike to him for any reason, 
She will drag him down into the cold, dark depths and make him her slave and he'll never be seen again. It's all nonsense, Mrs. Gartsan interrupted. There's another story that's an old woman and I'd a few of the farmers hereabouts and they accused her of being a witch. They got the local parson involved and it was decided to put her to the test by throwing her in the pool. Poor lass couldn't swim and so she drowned and the parson said that proved she'd been a witch all along. She chuckled, and then added, Some said the old woman had turned cow's milk sour and made horses lame and sheep miscarry. Others reckoned she were a Roman Catholic, and had annoyed the parson because she wouldn't convert. Aye, and they reckon that parson disappeared, and rumour has it that he lives in a great cavern beneath the mermaid's pool, having to wait on the mermaid and the old woman night and day, and will only be seen again on the final judgment day. From what I've been told, it all goes back to Celtic pagan times, long before Christianity or Parsons were heard of, Ralph informed them. The eve of Easter is the clue. Pagans divided the year into two, the dark half and the light half, and in Britain the light half roughly begins in April. They also believed that a pool was the entrance to another world. There's even one idea that the pool is that deep it connects with the Irish Sea, and that's how the mermaid arrived here in the first place. It all sounds very spooky to me, Rosie said, and the wind's getting up something fierce. Well, you're going to have to brave the elements, Rosie, Ralph said. It's time we all went down to the old quarry. Why? Because it's November the 4th and we're having the bonfire tonight because the 5th is Sunday, Connie informed her. Oh, I forgot about bonfire night. But how are you getting there? Same as your granddad, if he's coming, on a crutch. She shuffled a bottom across the room into a corner by the old Welsh dresser, retrieved her emergency walking aid, and Rosie watched as she used it to pull herself upright. Once having it under her armpit, she swung around triumphantly. You can help me, Rosie, by shining a torch so neither of us trips up. Can you get me coat, hat and scarf, Ralph? Grandad looked on in wonder. If he'd been asked to walk down to the quarry two minutes before, he'd have made his excuses. Now he realised he had little choice but to accompany them. <laughs> From that moment on, Connie and Rosie became virtually inseparable, at least when Rosie visited the farm, and on the occasions when Connie was the guest of her mother and granddad. Rosie already had a caring instinct and a respect for her elders, not least because of the role her grandfather had played in her life, but Connie provided something to emulate. A zest for life and a determination to overcome difficulties in a way that Rosie had hitherto not encountered. Furthermore, Ralph's statement that his little sister was as tough as old boots and was always up to some kind of mischief was soon to be proved an understatement if ever there was one. Quite naturally, Rosie had enjoyed the bonfire and the fireworks, the hot potatoes baked in the embers at the side of the fire, the old maid parking, which seemed to have been brought to the event by every household, such was its abundance. The sticky treacle toffee, the displays of Catherine wheels and golden fountains, the Roman candles, and the final barrage of rockets fired off in the general direction of the moon. But the thing that stuck in her mind for a long time after was the pluckiness of her young female companion. At one point, a group of lads were throwing rip raps behind their elders' ankles. Connie had confronted three of them, who'd frightened a particularly frail old lady. One of them told her she was now but a one-legged cripple, and to mind thy own business. Without a word, she'd made a pretend lunge at him, and, as he turned to flee, shot out her crutch, expertly tripping him up in the process, 
and sending him flying into the mud churned up by the congregation's boots, much to the mirth of his companions. I might be a one-legged cripple, she told him, but I'm twice as fast as thee, Mikey Grimsditch, and always will be. No Man Has a Right to Own Mountains Chapter 10 Winter had come and gone, and Rosie was almost part of the Gartside farmhouse furniture. She spent so much time under their roof. Sometimes her mother accompanied her, sometimes Grandad, and sometimes both. But increasingly, she visited on her own. The long Easter school holidays of 1990 were no different, and on Friday the 6th of April, she disembarked from the bus in Hayfield, and was walking up the Kinder Road, eager to meet up with Connie, Titch and Ralph. It was one of those lovely spring afternoons, with a slight westerly wind. The sky was clear, and the leaves were in bud, as she crunched gravel, and eventually made her way onto the winding track up to Colwell Clough. As she trudged uphill, she could hear the burbling brook tumbling and falling over its rock-strewn bed below and to her right, and the bleating of sheep on the opposite hillside. The track narrowed, and she was under a lace-work canopy of trees lining both sides, the steep-sided banking in their shade, a vivid azure carpet of nodding bluebells. Aha, gotcha! Connie emerged from behind a tree, a face illuminated by a smile. Overcoming her initial surprise, Rosie laughed. How long have you been there? Ages, you're late, you've been dawdling. How's your mother? She's fine, except she's fussing about like a mother hen. She's three people staying this weekend. You're going to have to share my room again. How awful, Rosie responded, pulling her face in mock distaste. You'd better not put your leg under my bedclothes like you did last time. It's a lovely leg, Rosie, far better than the old one. I'm practising for school sports day. Mikey Grimsditch thinks he's still the fastest runner in our class, but he's in for a surprise this year. As if to prove her point, she set off up the road, Rosie desperately trying to keep up with her. They crested the hill by the farm gate, neck and neck. Ralph was perched atop it. Titch appeared and ran to greet them, jumping up at Rosie in delight. She knelt down to fondle his ears, and he licked her face to show his appreciation. Did you have a good journey, Rosie? Yes, thanks, Ralph. She looked up at him. His face broke into a smile and his teeth flashed white against the background of his brown face. It struck her all of a sudden. He was quite a handsome lad. She returned his smile, and he jumped down. Let me take your rucksack, you must be tired. She slipped it off her shoulder and handed it to him. They were just about to make their way around the side of the cow buyer to access the yard and the kitchen door, when they were attracted by the sound of nailed boots advancing towards them. Two men were coming down the track both dressed in greeny-brown camouflage jackets and trousers. Ralph frowned and leant back, lounging against the stone wall as they passed, deep in conversation. Then he walked out into the lane, as if to see which way they went, and then came back. "'What's the matter, Ralph?' Connie asked, sensing her big brother was worried about something. "'Let's get round the back. They both keep us, and I reckon they're up to no good.' I want to see where they're going. They did as he asked, but when they reached the yard, Mrs. Gartside was collecting her washing off the line. Hi, young Rosie. How are you? Great, Mrs. Gartside. Can I help? Without waiting for an answer, she began to pull a sheet off the line, and the farmer's wife helped to fold it, before placing it in the wicker basket with the rest. Meanwhile, Ralph and his sister were peering into the distance both leaning against the dry stone wall. Thanks, Rosie, love. Come inside, we'll have a brew. The woman and the girl made their way into the kitchen. Old Mr. Gartside was slumped in his favourite armchair by the fire, a newspaper on his lap and fast asleep, judging by his intermittent soft snuffling snores. 
They'd already made the brew by the time Ralph and Connie entered. Ralph looked across at his father. Rosie thought he was going to say something to him, but he hesitated and then turned away, obviously reluctant to wake him. Eventually Mrs. Gartside gave her husband a prod and summoned all to the table for their evening meal. She told them that her paying guests had only boot bed and breakfast, and had informed her they'd be dining in the George in Afield that evening. Mr. Gartside nodded, and suggested he might look into converting the barn for self-catering accommodation, pointing out another farmer in Barber Booth was doing the same. Throughout the meal, Ralph remained unusually quiet, and after they'd finished, he'd refused a cup of tea, and seemed increasingly rested. In fact, at the first opportunity, he said he had someone to see, donned his jacket, and was out the door before anybody could query what he was in such a hurry for. Titch seized his opportunity and followed him. It wasn't until Rosie and Connie were alone in the bedroom, getting undressed, that the younger girl brought up the subject that had troubled Ralph earlier. By then it was raining hard, drops rattling against the window panes in noisy gusts, as if somebody was throwing small pebbles against the glass to annoy them. The wind had got up and was howling round the farmhouse. The old tree at the back of the house, almost adjacent to their window, creaked ominously as it swayed under its influence. Connie informed Rosie that a pair of peregrine falcons had returned for a second year, to rebuild their nest on a gritstone outcrop near the kinder downfall above the mermaid's pool. Evidently, the raptors were still fairly rare in the area, having been persecuted, along with all other falcons and hawks, since the land was enclosed. Ralph had found a dead raven near the same site only the previous Wednesday. He thought it had been poisoned, perhaps accidentally, by insecticide but when he'd seen the two keepers in camouflage and noticed they'd struck off across open land towards the mermaid's pool, his suspicions had been aroused. Poisoning and trapping ravens and raptors was common in the areas where land was reserved for game, although the birds were supposed to be protected by the law. Last year, Father found a goshawk's nest scattered around the base of a tree, Somebody had climbed up it and taken the complete nest. That's terrible, Rosie responded. Yes, and there were three eggs all smashed next to it. So that's where Ralph was going. I thought he rushed his tea and he never said a word before he put on his jacket and left in such a hurry. Yes, he's gone to check on the nest. But why should anybody want to harm the birds? Sheer ignorance and prejudice, that's what Ralph says. The keepers see the raptors as a threat to their blessed grouse. Sometimes they'll take a chick or even their eggs, but they only do it to live. They have to eat the same as any creature. The keepers guard the grouse so that gangs of boys with sticks can beat them more and drive them to where the gentry are waiting behind their hides to blast them out of the sky with their double barrel shotguns. She smiled wryly at Rosie. They call it sport. Ralph calls it butchery, and the people who do it spineless cowards and chinless wonders. He loves birds. In fact, he loves all wild things. If he ever catches a keeper, or anybody else for that matter, arming any wild thing, well, I'd hate to be in their boots. He's a really lovely boy, Rosie said, as she climbed into bed and snuggled under the blanket. Connie, gave her a knowing look, before saying, Good night, sleep tight, as she switched off the bedside light. Watch the bugs don't bite, responded Rosie. Both girls were soon in the land of Nod, dreaming their distinctive dreams. Rosie found herself standing in a shaft of sunlight on a jagged rock, looking down at the mermaid's pool, its surface partially shrouded in a milky white mist. A gigantic bird with a curved yellow beak 
and piercing black and gold eyes suddenly appeared, flying out of the pool in a great shower of spray. At first she thought it carried a mermaid on its back, but when she looked again, she realised that what she'd assumed was a fish tail, stretched along its tail feathers, was in fact a single slender leg, coated in tiny water droplets, glistening silver for all the world like shiny scales. The girl turned and smiled at her and waved, she had distinctive green eyes and long carroty red hair floating about her head and face in the warm fresh spring breeze like a banner of defiance or of revolution. No Man Has a Right to Own Mountains Chapter 11 Both girls rose early the next morning. The wind and rain had spent their fury. Some were shafting into the room through a gap in the curtains, and the air seemed alive with birdsong. I think we should walk over towards Mam Tor, Connie suddenly said, as she donned her artificial limb with its new vacuum socket. We'll get on to the ridge of Rusherpedge and go over to Mam Nick. Rosie nodded perfectly happy to walk wherever the younger girl decided. Will we be able to go to the summit and see the hill fort? Hopefully, once we're at Mam Nick, it's only a fairly short, steep scramble. Will we need to take food? No, there's usually a mobile food stall in the car park below it, and sometimes an ice cream van. By the time they'd gone downstairs, Mrs. Gartside was dishing out bacon and eggs to Ralph. His father sat beside him, a used plate wiped clean, indicating he'd already had his fill. Both were in discussion, the latter seemingly agitated about something. Good morning, everybody, Rosie said. Ah, it's a lovely day, lass, the old farmer responded, his mood changing in an instant. Did they both have a good sleep? What are their plans for today, our Connie? I'm taking Rosie over Mount Famine and then up Rusherpedge, and on to Mam Tor. Eh, hey, lass, are they sure it's a good walk? That's why we're going there. Not much point if it's not a good walk, is it? The old man laughed. I wish I could keep up with the Connie love, I really do. He rose from his seat and left the room, emerging in moments, wearing a rather ragged old coat and a battered and equally old flat cloth cap. Right, I'll love thee and leave thee, and mind you remember what I said, Ralph. Everything will be fine, Feather. Stop fretting. Well, look on. I won't be back till late afternoon. I'll go and pick old Sutcliffe's brains about his self-catering barn, and then I'm off to see our Richard and Jem in Bradwell. OK, Feather. I'll see to things here. Well, just don't forget that you in barn. I reckon she's about to drop twins, and she always has problems dropping more than one. Don't worry, Feather. I can't help worrying, lad. I don't know what we're going to do about cows unless we can find somebody else to take milk. He was about to close the kitchen door behind him when he turned and grinned at Rosie. Have a good day, lass, and don't let that doubt of mine lead you into mischief. Hmm, Connie exclaimed, turning to Ralph as soon as her father had disappeared. I was hoping you and Titch would come with us. So did I. Rosie said, without thinking. Ralph gave her a bemused look and then turned to his sister as Rosie blushed. It can't be out, Connie, but take Titch, he'll keep you out of trouble. Fat chance, I'm always dragging him out of holes. He's never got me out of one yet. Well, there's a first time for everything now I come. Can I get a word in sideways? Porridge first, please, Mum, Connie responded whilst Rosie nodded her head to second the motion. Mrs. Gartside retreated to her stove once more, wondering when her guests would appear in the front parlour. After breakfast, Ralph went into the yard, returning moments later with a stick in his hand. I've made this for you, Connie. His sister bridled. 
I don't need a walking stick, Ralph. I'm not an old maid. Well, don't take it then. There's plenty of able-bodied folk will be proud of that. I use a stick myself when I'm climbing steep slopes. He broke into a laugh. I'm sorry. I suppose you're going to be sensible and take the easy way, aren't you? Oh, no, I'm not. She glared at him for a moment, but then put out her hand. Let me see it. He handed it over. She weighed it up. The knobbly hazel shaft felt smooth to the touch. He'd obviously spent a lot of time sanding it shiny smooth before applying the varnish, but it was the top that was its crowning glory. It consisted of an intricately shaped and highly polished ram's arm. After some time of close and detailed inspection, she turned her sharp green eyes onto him. It's beautiful, Ralph, she said quietly. It must have taken you ages. Thank you ever so much. His eyes lit up. Do you really like it, Con? Of course I do. In fact, I might take it with me after all, just in case Rosie gets tired. It might come in handy for her. I'll make one for you, Rosie. I'll try and have it ready in a few weeks' time. With that he turned on his heels and they watched him as he crossed the yard and disappeared through the small gap in the wall that led to the field where the sheep had been brought down to lamb. Ralph's ever so clever, Connie said. He's ever so lovely, Rosie declared. Connie gave her a loop, suppressing a giggle. Romance is in the air. It happens every spring, she remembered her mother once saying but she decided to keep her thoughts to herself, for the time being at least. Nonetheless, she couldn't help wondering how Ralph would react when she finally told him he had an ardent admirer, who on more than one occasion had said he was a lovely boy. The two girls sat side by side near the trig point on Mam Tor, enjoying the warm sun, the view over the Winnet's Pass and the plateau of the White Peak. Connie had explained that the ridge of Russia Pedge and that of Montour marked the boundary of the Dark Peak, so-called because the predominant rocks were comprised of millstone grit, with its limestone counterpart. Rosie had been struck by the sharp contrast between the dark dry stone walls of their immediate area and the bright white walls of the latter. Furthermore, the grass and vegetation over the valley was a much brighter green, than the dark olives and browns of their immediate surroundings. Connie had also taken the trouble to take her down onto the main road before retracing their steps and making the final ascent of Mam Tor. She'd shown her the junction where the road swung right to access Minutes Pass and from there make its way to the village of Castleton in the Oak Valley far below. At this junction, however, she'd branched left where the old coach road had taken the shorter route snaking along the southern face of the steep-sided hill before descending steeply. Only walkers and cyclists can use it now, she explained. Mam Tor is basically a massive lump of gritstone lying on top of shale, which is unstable. Large sections have slipped. She'd shown her to the top section of what had once been the main road, now closed off to traffic. Great cracks zigzagged along the old tarmac, and in more than one place large sections of the road were ten feet below what had once been their adjoining surface. That's why it's called the Shivering Mountain, she informed her friend. It's always on the move. Once having retraced their steps to Mam Nick, where the road into Edale left the main road, through a narrow valley separating Rushapeds from Mam Tor, they'd soon accessed a footpath over a stile, and made it to the high point of the latter. Here, both girls had been glad to flop down onto the sheep-cropped turf to rest their weary limbs. Oh my goodness, where did he come from? Connie laughed at Rosie's exclamation. A young man had suddenly appeared over their immediate horizon, having soared upwards on a thermal, transported through the air by means of his hand glider. He hovered straight in front of them only a few yards away as if held in the air by an unseen hand before soaring upwards once more and to their right. Rosie gazed in wondering admiration, her eyes following every graceful manoeuvre of the pilot. 
I wish I could do that, she finally ejaculated. It must be absolutely amazing. So would I, a companion concurred. He soars like a buzzard on outstretched wings. She turned to Rosie, suddenly serious. That reminds me of something. When I first lost Millet, I had terrible problems, Rosie. I was so sad all the time. I thought my world had come to an end. I started having all kinds of nightmares and funny things happen when I was awake. How do you mean? I'd suddenly get a pain in my foot as if I had cramp in my toes or something. But it was my right foot and I didn't have a right foot. Weird things like that. Sometimes it would be a sudden stabbing pain and sometimes like an electric shock. Anyway, it went on for months. Sometimes I'd be fine for weeks at a time and then suddenly it would start all over again. It must have been awful. Yes, it was. It drove me mad. My hand would go down to the spot and there'd be nothing there except for our plastic and metal if I had my leg on. But then, one night, I went to bed early. I was really tired for some reason. It was raining and there was a wind and the old tree was creaking like anything. It must have been spooky. No, I quite like it. It's like music. I find it soothing. I love it when the rain rattles against the window. Anyway, I went off to sleep, and I had the most fantastic dream. The rain had stopped. It was a starlit night, and there was a full moon. I found myself running up to the mermaid's pool. It was shimmering silver, and I dived straight in. Next thing, I realised I couldn't get out, and I thought I would drown. It became very cold, really freezing, and then somebody had hold of me and everything went black. I woke up in a great cave, and the mermaid sat next to me. Except she wasn't a mermaid at all. She had legs, and she was wearing a beautiful, long, white, shimmering dress of some silky material I'd never seen the like of. She was combing my hair and singing softly in a language I didn't understand. Then she asked in English how I'd got there with only one leg. She had a soft sing-song accent that seemed like a mixture of Welsh and Irish. I didn't know how I'd got there, really. I thought I'd run there. I'd somehow forgotten I only had one leg. What happened then? How did you escape? I didn't want to escape. It was lovely and warm, and there was a kind of pale pinkish glow about everything. She was lovely, and I felt safe with her. But then, she said, I must go, and she carried me further into the cave. There was a giant bird. It looked like a buzzard, but much bigger. She placed me on its back and told me to grip its feathers tight, and then it took off, but it flew out the way we had come and dived into the water. I thought I was going to drown again, but next minute we were bursting out of the pool into bright warm sunlight and it carried me all the way home, soaring and diving on the way. I remember wondering how I could make my way across the yard on one leg, but the very next minute Ralph was waking me up to carry me downstairs for breakfast, and I realised it was all a dream. Rosie didn't say a word, remembering all too vividly her own dream just the previous night. The thing is, Rosie, I've never really been unhappy since that moment, and I've never had any phantom pains in the missing part of my leg either. It was as though I come to terms with the fact that the bottom half of my right leg had gone forever. She smiled before continuing. Ralph used to tell me there's no such word as can't. Now I know what he meant, and I also realise that nothing is really impossible. All I have to do is try, and I can make things happen, if I really want them to happen and work at it long enough. That's amazing, Rosie said quietly. She wondered if she should relate her own dream, but decided not to. Instead, she suggested they walk down to the car park and get an ice cream before returning to the farm. However, before they arrived, Connie came up with another surprise. I just remembered... In my dream, the water nymph told me her name was Coventina. I'd never heard that name before. When I asked Ralph, he told me it was the name of the Celtic water goddess. 
No Man Has a Right to Own Mountains, Chapter 12 I've had a brilliant idea. Rosie looked across the bedroom. Connie sat on the side of her bed with a triumphant look on her face as she struggled to remove her leg. What is it? She finally got it off with a grunt and let it slip to the floor. It's Easter Eve on Thursday. We could go up to the pool and see if Coventina appears at midnight. We've already discussed this. The grown-ups won't let us. They don't have to know. But how can we get out of the house without them knowing? Simple. We borrow Ralph's tent tomorrow and pitch it in the old paddock. Then we'll camp out every night. So, you see, we won't have to leave the house to go up to the pool. But how do we persuade them to let us camp? We'll tell them your mother's taking you camping in the summer and you need to practice. I can't do that. It's not true. Rosie. Connie's tone indicated disappointment with her friend's seeming lack of spirit. Rosie laughed. It's Grandad that's promised to take me camping. You mean you'll do it? Yes, of course I will. Right. Last one to sleep brings me tea in bed in the morning. Sleep tight, Connie. Make sure the bugs don't bite. Thus the initial plans were made. Little did the two girls know what they were letting themselves in for. Other spirits were planning to be out and about that auspicious night, full of meaning as it was for practising pagans and Christians alike. It had proved surprisingly easy to persuade Ralph to allow them to use his tent. To cap it all, he'd volunteered his sleeping bag and insulated mat for their use, and then gone into a field bring him back another bag and mat he'd borrowed from a friend. Once they had him on side, persuading Connie's mother was an easy task. On the Tuesday night it started to rain heavily at 9.30, and Mrs. Gartside had hurried out to persuade them to spend the night indoors, but they'd assured her they'd be fine. Ralph's mountain tent was both wind and stormproof. We're as snug as a bug in a rug, Rosie assured her, and we have everything we need. On the Thursday evening, there was a full moon and a clear sky. The air was sharp, and the radio had forecast frost. They'd walked up to the pool earlier in the day, and selected a spot where two great wind-sculpted boulders with another balanced on top formed a small shelter, from which they had a good view of the pool, whilst remaining protected from any wind or rain if the weather forecast proved wrong. They were now walking away from the paddock, Connie armed with her walking stick, and Rosie carrying a torch, although she didn't believe they'd need to use it. Suddenly an owl hooted somewhere from a tree behind the farmhouse. Rosie jumped and looked around, surprised by the unexpected sound. Tony Owl Mail, Connie informed her. Then an echoing cry from across the clough. <whistles> Tony Owl Female. It's that time of year when wild creatures are either begetting or begatting. Rosie laughed. <laughs> Somewhere a dog barked as she adjusted the rucksack slung across her right shoulder. They listened for an answering call, but none came. Disappointed dog, Rosie decided. They continued towards their objective, the incline increasing the further they moved away from the farm. They were following a narrow sheep path, a distinct black ribbon against the rough grasses, which were beginning to turn a pale grey in the moonlight. The weather forecast seemed to be proving to be correct. Connie remained in the lead, and Rosie was quite happy to follow in her footsteps. She noticed how her companion swung her right leg in a slight outward curve as she brought it up off the ground to swing it forward for the next step, giving her a very slight rolling gait. Otherwise, she decided, nobody could possibly know it was a replacement lower limb. Then they heard somebody whistling, out of tune, followed by laughter and chattering voices. Doesn't sound travel at night, Connie remarked. That's people leaving the sportsman. Rosie pushed up the left sleeve of her windproof. 
It's almost half past eleven by my watch, she replied quietly. Good, our time is perfect, Connie said. She pointed with her stick without stopping. There's the pool. If we follow the track to the left behind it and then scramble up there, we'll be home and dry. As long as the mermaid doesn't pull us down into the deep, watery depths. Connie stopped in her tracks and turned towards her. Rosie caught the flash of green as the moonlight touched her friend's eyes. For a moment, they looked just like a cat's, a wild cat. Coventina is not a mermaid, Rosie. She's a water goddess. That's why she can grant immortality. Rosie smiled, but she couldn't help thinking Connie sounded serious, as though the distinction was somehow of importance. The younger girl turned away and continued upwards before she could respond to her statement. The sheep track disappeared, and the grass crackled sharply beneath their feet. The frost was coming fast. Here we are, Connie announced. Rosie slung her bag off her shoulder. Help me put this old blanket on the ground. We're going to need both. They soon settled in their snug hideaway, one blanket protecting them from the cold ground, and the other wrapped around their feet, legs, and up to their chins. What time is it, Rosie? Twenty-three minutes to go. The pool lay immediately below them, about thirty feet away, a dark, shimmering patch against the grey background, its surface illuminated by the moon, and rippled by a slight breeze. They remained sat next to each other, their arms cuddling their knees, their sides meeting and their blanket clutched around them for warmth. It was becoming far colder than they'd expected. Connie pulled a woolly hat downwards over her forehead and the back of her head. What time is it now? Fifteen minutes to go. Don't the farmhouse lights look bright? Yes, Dad should be home from the pub by now. Mum will be making his cocoa. Time was dragging, and Rosie became increasingly tense. The silence seemed overwhelming, and the whole atmosphere somewhat spooky. Connie seemed to sense her friend's anxiety, but it was Rosie who broke the silence. Where did Ralph go? I've no idea. Shall I tell him you fancy him tomorrow? Don't you dare, Connie Garside. The youngster laughed. So you do fancy him? I never said that. You said he was a lovely boy. In fact, you said it twice. I just meant... Well, go on. What did you just mean? Before Rosie could answer her annoying little friend, a man's voice floated upwards. Do you have to do that? Sure up, I need a fag. Well, we don't need everybody knowing we're up here lighting a fag, sending a signal for miles. The girl stared into the dark, trying to discover where the voices came from. There they are, Connie whispered, pointing downhill to her left. They're coming up here, they'll ruin everything. Rosie strained her eyes and followed Connie's pointing finger, but it was all in vain. She could see no sign of human beings. Then a flash of fire as the smoker lit his cigarette. Who can they be? Keep your voice down, Rosie. I don't know who they are, but I do know we have to get rid of them. How on earth can we do that? How good are you at imitating a mermaid? No, Connie, don't do it. Too late, the stone was already on its way, speeding through the cold night air to its intended target. Both men stood to the left of the pool, staring upwards and away from it as if trying to work out the best way to get to whatever their objective was. They turned, startled by the loud, echoing plop, as the stone landed exactly where Connie wanted it to go. Ripples disturbed the centre of the pool, widening out in a growing circle of ruffled water. The thrower drew breath and began to open her mouth, intending to scream like a banshee and put the fear of the goddess up the man. But as she began to do so, one of them pointed across to the far side of the water. The alarm in his voice was clear and distinct. Jesus wept! It's the mermaid! Simultaneously, they both took flight, running down the hillside as if the hounds of hell were on their heels. 
The two girls looked at each other in disbelief. Events were moving faster and far more dramatically than they could possibly have envisaged. Then Rosie was on her feet, thrusting the blankets aside, panic in her voice. Come on, we've got to get out of here. Connie stood up but didn't move, rooted to the spot in amazement at the sight her eyes were revealing to her confused brain. Seconds later, she pulled herself together, a broad smile illuminating her face. No, it's all right, don't. Rosie was already yards away and running fast as if trying to outpace the men. Rosie, it's all right, it's Coventina. She won't hurt us. She has the old woman and the parson with her. Come back. Her friend was still running and continued to do so. Connie looked across the pool. The young woman in the long white robe remained standing on the rock, her hands uplifted to the moon, a golden hair streaming down her back. An older woman and a man stood on the rough tussock grass either side of her. Both were looking upwards, and both were dressed in similar white robes. The young lass began to walk towards them, stick in hand, absolutely calm, as if this was a regular occurrence. Rosie suddenly felt guilty, ashamed she'd abandoned the girl who she regarded as her closest friend. She stopped and turned to see her walking around the near side of the pool, obviously intent on joining the mysterious, ghostly apparitions. Connie! Connie! Don't go near! Don't! The girl either ignored or simply didn't hear her. Rosie began to run back the way she'd come, continuing to shout. The wind rose in a sudden wailing gust, carrying the sound of her voice away from her, and in the wrong direction. She tried to run faster, growing desperate and in great fear for her friend's safety, but the increasing steepness of the hillside was rapidly turning her legs to head. She looked across and saw the younger apparition embracing Connie and enfolding her in the long white robe. At that point she tripped and fell full length. Oh, Connie, poor darling Connie, she sighed in a frustrated torment of hopelessness and desperation. No Man Has a Right to Own Mountains Chapter 13 The inquest into events on the land adjacent to Gartsai's farm came later. Two young, rather inquisitive and highly imaginative girls had proceeded up to the mermaid's pool on the night of April the 12th, 1990. Two delighted young girls returned in the early hours of Friday the 13th, unlucky for some, although both had reasons to be somewhat embarrassed. They were accompanied by two women and one man. All three of the latter were members of the ancient Manchester Order of Druids. On their way back to the farm, where the three pagans were paying guests, lovely people, so quiet you wouldn't know they were there, according to Elsie. They came across Ralph, armed with a stout stick, standing over one of the men who had fled down the hill earlier. The latter looked sullen and defeated as he slumped against the dry stone wall, clutching his ankle. Connie's brother looked across to them as they approached. Rosie, Connie, what are you doing out at this time of night? Catching gamekeepers by the look of it, his sister responded. Aye, two of them came charging down here as if there was no tomorrow. I tripped this one with my stick. He pointed to a stout canvas bag lying nearby. Open that, Connie, but be careful. Don't put your hand inside. She did as he asked. What's in there? One pigeon, dead and bloody. One plastic pigeon, a lure no doubt. One pole trap, a small bag with a drawstring top. OK, Connie, that's enough. He turned to the keeper, a grim smile on his face. Looks as though you're in serious trouble, Colin. A pole trap to break or cut off the legs of a peregrine falcon. A poison law for a raven or any other carrion eater. A bag of strychnine, no doubt. And an artificial law for any raptor. You're going to jail, I reckon. 
You've already killed a raven close to here. It's buried in our yard. It won't take long to dig it up, and I bet the poison in the pigeon and in that bag are all from the same source. The keeper remained silent, but inside he too knew the game was up, and it wasn't the game he was paid to protect by his lord and master, the Duke of Thingamibob, the privileged and hereditary successor to a land thief. And never a knowing and known receiver of stolen goods, as Grandad pointed out to young Rosie, when she finally had the chance to relate the full story to him. Our noble duke is the real villain of the piece. Them two keepers had no but his lackeys, dependent on his largesse for their wages, and the duke himself in his turn is but an ignorant victim of a system dedicated to the maintenance of a tiny minority, comprising money-grubbers, rich rogues, wealthy thieves and assorted vagabonds. Rosie continued to be a regular visitor to Gartsai's farm, and later that year Connie beat Maggie Grimsditch in the 100-yard dash and became school champion. She confessed to Rosie the same evening that she quite liked Maggie, evidently shortly after she lost her leg and on her first day back at school following the accident, he told her not to worry, he loved her, and one day they'd marry. Now I've got him where I want him, chasing me. One of these days I'll surprise him again and let him catch me. This audio book has been brought to you by the Northern Grove Publishing Project in support of the Working Class Movement Library 51 The Crescent, Salford, M5 4WX. The story continues in the second book, Connie Gartsai's Triumph, in which the girls continue to enjoy adventures together and preparations begin to be made for the 60th anniversary of the Mass Trespass of Kinder Scout.